want to welcome everybody who is here now and those who are going to continue to arrive to the Spinning Basics class with bonus content, you could make your own spindle. <laughs> now, I'm not going to be doing absolutely everything about spinning, but I am going to try and give you some starter places to think about how to make yarn by hand with some of the simplest tools possible, how to do a tiny bit of troubleshooting when you're thinking about what's going wrong, how, why is this not working? And also to give you uh, some pointers to the number of rabbit holes you could go down as you start to troubleshoot or scheme and plan what kind of yarn you might like to make in the world. So when I talk about spinning, obviously, I'm not talking about a stationary bicycle and I'm not talking about twirling around um, like a small child to make myself dizzy and fall down. Oh. <laughs> but I am talking about taking fiber and turning it into something like yarn or thread or string. And there are a number of misconceptions about how that's done. And so what I want to try and do is make it as simple as possible so that you can not only get really good at this if you want to, but figure out how to practice if that's what you really need. So what is string? This is a huge, weird question. You are welcome to unmute and suggest some ideas to me. What is string? Is it twisted fibers? Is it? What do you think? Twisted fibers? What else can we say about string? What is string? It's stuff you buy at the store. It could be possibly purchased, yes. Well, string as opposed to yarn, yes, definitely. Is there a distinction? Only in the material used. Well, perhaps in English, there might be a distinction between string and yarn, but is that universal? If I snitched. <laughs> so we have to think about, you know, what are we asking here? What is string? Well, if I've got a bunch of fibers and I'm gonna go ahead and switch to my overhead camera and I'm gonna pin this, add pin. I think I'll even take away the pin of my face talking. We don't need that one as much. There we go. This happens to be hair from a sheep, but it didn't grow in bright pink. Um, it probably grew in about this color of white, but it probably didn't look this nice when the, you gave the sheep a haircut. And it also wasn't this long. Kat, can you spotlight that camera? I thought I had. Let me try that again. Let's do that go to here go back to this go here spotlight aha i pressed the wrong button thank you sarah for the reminder let's see so let me move my mouse out of the way so here we've got something pink and fuzzy from a sheep but didn't come that way there's something white and fuzzy from a sheep but also didn't come this way it's definitely clean and pretty feels nice to touch but if I tug on these little hairs, I can pull them off the mass. And they may or may not get visible until I start stacking more and more of them on top of each other. Now, this is the size of the hair that was cut off the sheep. This is a great way to test what is this mystery fiber that your friend gave you for your birthday because they heard you were spinning. You know, they, they didn't know how to shop for you. You don't know how to shop for you. You have random mystery fiber. The first thing you can do with random mystery fiber is just tug on the little ends and see if you can pull things loose. I would love to advise, maybe don't do this in a windy space. Um, hair up the nose, fur up the nose, less than ideal. <laughs> but if you just tug lightly, you can pull little hairs off. Now, if I put my hands close together on this mass of fiber and my hands are close, when I tug, it feels like when you're holding somebody's long hair in a braid and you're not going to be able to tear it or break it. Well, I hope you cannot tear it or break it by tugging gently on parts of the braid. And that's because if you look at how close my hands were, they were closer together than just 
the little hairs right here that I've pulled off the thing. So my hands are close together. I'm not going to be able to pull them apart. But if I'm tugging off the end and my hands are further apart than the size of the little hairs, the little hairs can come off the mass of this commercially purchased and lovingly uh, stored in my house wool fiber. Well, not all fiber looks like this. So let me get a couple other samples out. You might have some locks from a sheep or a goat that are much larger curls. And they're a little bit more sticky. They're harder to pull apart. They stay together in little clumps. So this is often described as a lock of hair from this animal, but it can still be teased apart. Now this lock, it's pretty easy to see about how long the hair was when it was give a, a sheep a haircut or give a goat a haircut, depending on what kind of animal or give an alpaca a haircut. But if I tug the two ends, I can pull pieces off from either end, as long as my hands are not holding the same hairs at the same time. But, okay, so these are fibers and Alex had suggested twisted fibers is string. Okay, if I twist this, it's got twist, is that string? It's not string yet. So there has to be something more to it. It needs to have overlap. These little hairs are about that long. I want to have hairs that overlap in a series or a serial fashion. That twist has to have some minimum amount to have some structural reliability. So I can twirl these with my fingers. If I let go, it kind of wants to sort of untwist a little bit, but if I'm really crafty about trapping it under an elbow and twirling it with my fingers and never letting all the ends go, it's starting to look more string-like. But if I don't have enough twist for the mass of fibers that are there, it will still eventually disintegrate and fall back apart into fibers. So there's twist and there's overlap and the twist has a quantity. And then it's up to you to decide what quantity to um, add for the twist and whether that's sufficient or it's too much. So we've got little hairs there. Let me move that out of the way. There are some myths also about enough twist, too much twist. So if I take some of this pretty, let me get one of my colorful ones. Maybe that'll show up better on the camera. Ah, this is also really easy to tug in different directions. I can tug the direction that all the hairs were organized by the manufacturer or the vendor. So there's my long direction of tugging, but I can also pull it apart and make it poofier. And I like to think of this as kind of going from a garden hose to a fire hose quantity of water, of fiber. My source is now a large source as opposed to a narrow source. If it is super, super narrow, like water going through a garden hose, it's gonna be harder to tug and pull and separate. If it's poofier and wider, I've got a much larger hose for the water to go through, for the fiber source to move through. And that was a chance for me to find out if I like this fiber, how hard was it to pull apart? If wool or other fibers have been felted, this pull apart is really hard to do. So the first thing you do with any new fibers go, well, do I want to spin with this? Probably with this one. I also have the option here because this one's easy to pull. I can make it a narrow strip by just pulling some off. And one of the nice things about good fiber that was well prepared by some kind of a vendor or manufacturer uh, is that it will be easy to either separate long direction or separate along the direction that it was organized. 
Separating it that direction is often called pre-drafting. Okay, there's lots of jargon. I don't have a list of all the jargon. The internet has taken care of that. There is so much you can Google. <laughs> so rather than that, try to repeat everything that's in the good books and the good internet, I'm just gonna use jargon and try to explain it as I go. Myth busting number one I would like to share, you do not have to pre-draft. You could if you like, you don't have to. If I wanna use this entire garden hose as my source of fibers, when I get to the overlap plus twist equals string, I can. If I hate that, I don't have to. So I'm gonna show a little something on my screen. Share screen. The only wrong way to spin is to quit. That's my quote. I say that all the time. I've said that for years. There are three things that Abby Frankemont likes to say, and she's the one who has written the book called Respect the Spindle. Are you making yarn? Yes or no? Does it hurt? Yes or no? Do you like the yarn you made? Yes or no? So we'll start number one. If I have fiber and I'm twisting it, doing something with it, am I making yarn? Well, when I say, yes, I've made yarn, then, hey, cool, I'm on the right track. Does it hurt me? Uh, if it hurts me, it's time to make a change. And finally, do you like the yarn you made? Well, if you don't like it, that's where we start to go down the rabbit holes of all the ways that you can change and fix what you're doing as you are spinning. So it should be back to me. Are we still spotlighted on me? On my, on my fiber? Excellent. Thank you for the thumbs up. Okay, so how are we going to get twist into this? Well, now it's time to get an extraordinarily important tool in the world. It's a stick. This is, in fact, just a chopstick. This chopstick, I even put a marker line on one side and a different marker line on the other side. And the other different marker doesn't want to show. Okay, so you can't say that. We're good. Yay for the Sharpie, so that you can see if I turn the stick, that the stick is in fact turning. And I can turn it with my fingers. And you see the, the rotation happening? The nods and thumbs up, excellent. This is all you really need. You can just start with a stick. You do not have to buy a wheel. You do not have to uh, carve something or go out to a, buy a lathe and make things. You don't have to send hundreds of dollars across the internet to people to ship things. You could get a chopstick, and this is a stick. So we have to think about what direction our hands are working. If I've got my stick this direction, my hand is facing palm down. I'm holding on to the stick. I'm going to call that horizontal. And if I put my stick this direction, I'm going to call it vertical. Horizontal, vertical, horizontal, vertical. Other hand, horizontal, vertical, horizontal, vertical. I'm also trying to make certain I work with the camera because cameras are funny. Okay. If I am going to twirl it, I have the ability to twirl towards me or away from me with my fingers. I can spin it towards me or away from me. And you can decide what's the word away or towards. Over the top, over the bottom, doesn't matter. You're gonna pick one and you're gonna do it a lot until later you do the other. <laughs> so I'm not even gonna say left or right. It doesn't matter if you're right-handed or left-handed. It doesn't matter if you're gonna twirl up or down. You're gonna pick one rotation and it's gonna stay. So if I've got some fiber, mooch this out. And let's say it's a little bit longer than from my hand to my elbow. So I get my elbow in the shot. Woohoo! A little bit longer than from my hand to my elbow. I'm going to hold stick in one of my hands. I'm going to put fiber in the other hand and I'm going to pinch it. So now I have a spindle hand and I have a fiber hand. That's the big difference. Fiber hand, spindle hand. So it could be either way. Spindle hand has a stick, fiber hand does not have a stick. So I'm gonna hold on to it. And I have the ability to then wrap the fiber around the stick until my hands get close, and then I can pull it off the end. 
All right, well, that didn't do anything. Wait a minute, I wrapped, wrapped the yarn. Not yarn, it's not yarn yet. Pulled it off the end. Ah, I didn't change the orientation of the stick for this test. So I'm gonna wrap the fiber around it, the horizontal stick, <laughs> then I'm gonna turn it vertically and I'm gonna let it unroll off the stick. Whoa, what's happening in the middle there? There's a little curly cue. All right, let's do that again. We'll go horizontal, wrap the fiber around the stick, turn the stick, unroll the fiber off the stick. Holy crap, that looks like yarn. Twist is going to behave like when you unroll ribbon or roll ribbon or unroll toilet paper or roll toilet paper one direction versus the other. If you do one and then the other in sequence, there is more twist. And now there's so much twist, I have stored energy. That stored energy is ready to become more yarn. So what if I put some of that yarn on the stick and then rolled my hand out to the end of the fiber? Well, now the twist has all of that fiber that it can go into. So we'll do that again. Wrapping on a horizontal stick, unrolling from a vertical stick. I have big, poofy, thick yarn. Dude, whoa, how that happen? Ooh. Right? Okay, well, um, my hands are trapped. What am I gonna do? Ha ha. Cut them off. No, we're not cutting off my hands. Thank you, peanut gallery. I'm gonna roll the yarn back up for a second. I'm gonna set it down. Wait, why is it staying? Aha, Velcro. <laughs> this is the neatest thing in the world. I could be spinning and in charge of the small child who is into mischief. And I see that the small child needs to be rescued from running in front of swords, running into a fire, running into the stove, running into the traffic. All the mischief, running right into the dog full of big teeth or the cat with the trap belly exposed and I need to rescue the child. Take my spinning, throw it to the ground, run away, come back. Do not worry about your spinning, it's not that precious. You can totes come back to it and it will still work. Well, I ran out of fiber, so I need to get more fiber. All right, I have this giant thing. What if I didn't pre-draft and use only what I pre-drafted? All right, now I need new fiber management. So my favorite fiber management is I put on a bracelet. It's very high technical. It's a piece of yarn I made. It doesn't, it's not even long enough to really see the ends. I can't even remember if that's an end or a bump. But my fiber hand is this guy. This hanging down from my fiber hand gets in the way. So what I do is I hold it in my hand and back it up around my wrist and tuck it into a bracelet. Aha! Well, now I need to be able to manage how much of the fiber is going to go into the twist. So now I need a feeling of slidiness. It's extraordinarily technical jargon. Slidey, slidey, slidey. Now I'm cheating because I practiced for 23 years before I showed it to you on video. So let me, let me slow down and do that differently when it's not wrapped around my wrist. Remember when we were just pulling little bits off the end and then setting them down? Eee! You know, some days that's like all I can handle. I'm just gonna watch television and I'm gonna fix the evil yarn fiber source that's not being nice to me. And I'm just gonna pull the lens off in a non-winded space. Well, now my fiber source is just short. Hmm, that's not gonna wrap around my wrist really well. And maybe today my hands are sweaty. So just holding a giant pile full of fluff in my hand, maybe that's not the best source. But if I tug a little bit, I can start to fashion a long section of overlapped fibers that are gonna go into my twist. Aha, I could do that or I was given a crazy pile full of wool and I don't really wanna use this neon 
pink except for, well, it's all I have. Well, what if I want to mix some colors up? What if I mixed some crazy pink with some light pink with some white? And I'm extraordinarily poor because I'm still in college. I just got out of college. I didn't get a good job. It's a pandemic. I'm still an essential worker. I'm living in someone else's basement, not even my own. You know, I can still make do. <laughs> and I can take all of these colors here. When I add twist to them, now I have candy striping. I'm going to go back to Abby's question. Do you like the yarn that you're making? Hey, maybe I wanted candy striping. Well, how will I get it? Well, I could layer little fluffs of color on top of each other and twist them. What if I don't like that? What if I want more blendiness? Dun, 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 dun. Okay, it's still kind of stripey. Maybe I will flip some of them upside down on each other. Maybe I'll get out a set of pet combs. Um, maybe some cheap $1 pet combs from Wish. If I want to risk what the Wish ads are going to look like in my internet experience after that. So I could pet comb these out. And now I'm starting to get a blend of colors. Hey, that's pretty nice. Okay, now I can put some in my fiber hand, tuck the tail into my bracelet. And that slidey feel of little hairs going past each other is what I'm gonna need to use when I'm gonna add new fiber and do overlapping joins. All right, so I've got my little guy here. This is my old yarn. This is my new yarn, not quite yarn yet. Old yarn, new yarn, if they're both overlapping, the twist can go through both of them. I'll give you a little hint. Twist will jump over fat sections and land in the skinny sections like puddles. The twist doesn't like to stay on the top of the hill. It likes to go to the bottom of the hill. So if you have a variation of thick and thin, all your twist is going to want to be in the skinny spots because puddles. Here's my old fiber, new fiber. I'm going to put both of them next to each other and hold both of them in my fingers. Now, there are different ways to make joins. Here is one way. I'm going to unroll it a little off of my stick. I'm going to do my slow method for fat yarn on my horizontal stick. Unroll it, maybe just a little bit. Now, what if I also hold it with the other hand? There we go, and I've got a little peekaboo window, old fiber, new fiber. When I let go, I'm gonna start to see twist. What if I have more twist? Let's get more. Made up songs are purely optional for spinning. Okay, so I've got extra stored energy coiling up over here and I have a pinch over here trapping all of the twist in between those sections but now I slide my hand back the twist wants to go into everything so I have an option here if I wanted to I could spread this out and narrow down how many little hairs are going into the twist and I have the option to pinch it and then the twist goes to the pinch and it leaps over the fat bits and lands in the skinny bits. So there's the hill it jumped over and there's the puddle it landed in. So do, 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 do. roll now. Okay, well, I have a couple of options. I can get good at doing this one handed. Woohoo! Or if that's freaking me out, I can set down my stick. Get my other hand over here and help. If one handed is not working for you, it's okay to set your spindle down and do some fiber management, then pick it back up again. When I pick it back up again, there's no tension. So that's the next thing to add to our equation. We have fibers that are overlapping. We have twists that we are making. Now we have tension to apply to the entire length. 
So I'm going to do this off camera because it's really, really huge. So if you can find my, my small picture of me, I look ridiculous leaning back doing this. There we go. Now, when I unroll off the side, I've got more twist in there. And then I can wind up the new yarn onto my stick. So the other reason to have a stick is have a place to put all the yarn that you made. Because you only have your arm span at most to make yarn. Now, my arm span is going to be smaller because I'm a T-Rex and I have little tiny arms. But <laughs> I want more yarn than my own yarn, my own arm span. So the other reason to have a stick besides to help make the twist happen between the horizontal wrap, in this case, and the vertical unwind so that you can use the twist is to have a place to store the finished yarn or the currently current state yarn. It's not necessarily finished unless you really, really want it like that. Most fibers I would like to recommend are not done until they've seen water in some way. So wet finishing is a thing that happens. I'm gonna talk more about that in a moment. <sighs> My hand's a little bit tired. If you have been at all this time holding on to any stick of any sort and trying to twirl it while I've talked, your hands should be slightly tired by now. Has anyone been trying to twirl sticks while I talk? Feel free to grab a stick and try twirling a stick just by itself as I'm talking, as you're listening, as you're focusing on different stories that I'm telling you. After a while, these small motor movements are going to exhaust you. So let's go back to that third rule of Abby's. Does it hurt? Or second rule, does it hurt? Yeah, don't do the things that hurt. So we have to find ways to manage how long you're doing this so that your muscles get to build up some stamina and the posture that you're doing this with. Because if all I'm gonna do is twirl it in my hand, then I'm stuck doing in-hand grasped spinning, which is totally okay if you want to. There are, in fact, pictures of people spinning everything in their hand, grasp style. What if I want other ways to twirl things? And I've already brought out a stick that looks a lot different from a chopstick. What I have on the end here is a whirl. This one is carved into this stick. This stick is all one piece, no, no parts, but I could have. This is my favorite storage method for spinning a Ziploc bag that I just throw in another bag. <laughs> and there's the Velcro action going on here. I just took some fiber and wrapped it around the thread I made and it's fine. I can still pick it up at any time. I can pick it up at the point where the twist has stopped and I can pick it up to manage the stick with my spindle hand and my fiber hand. Well, if I have a weight on it, I have centrifugal force helping me. So I'm gonna switch from that spindle to some of the other cool things that I've done recently. And I'm jumping ahead of me, but I'm the only one that cares about whether I'm ahead of me or not. There's a stick with a thing on it. And here is a stick with a thing on it. And this stick is just a wooden dowel. And the thing on it is made out of polymer clay. And this is a stainless steel skewer and polymer clay. Why would I want a metal stick or a wooden stick? And why would I want little pointy bits there? What if I got out a cereal bowl and I twirled my stick? Let's see if I can get that in camera. Let's do it with the short one. Can you see the piece going around and around and around without me touching it? The weight is helping the twist keep going even when my muscles are relaxed. So I find one with a better. Aha, there's a good one. Cereal bowl, twirly, 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 twirly. And I'm not using any muscles at all, but it's adding all the twist. Twirly, 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 and I'm not using my muscles at all. So I've made a machine. The, the weight on the stick is going to help provide more twist. And this will be really important 
when the hairs that I'm working with from the different animals or the different plants are different lengths. Because if, and I'll just tell you this is a rule, but you can experiment with it. If my fibers are short, I know, sacrilege, she's taking scissors to wool. Ah, terrifying, right? Yeah, and it's now recorded for posterity. If my fibers are really short, like cotton, or um, you have a long-haired cat, but it's not as long as an alpaca, or you have a great underfur from a husky, or a chow, or whatever, you know, fuzzy animals around your house. I don't think your humans have undercoats that they are shedding, but Hey, maybe. And if you've collected these fibers and you really, really, really want them to be yarn, they're going to require a lot more twist for the overlap to work with the twist to make a string. So I'm adding lots and lots of twist. And now I'm not even doing anything but pulling out from this very, very light pinch. So how in the world is that happening? Do not death grip. If you are death gripping, you are probably hurting your body over time. Also, um, I can't pull if it's death grippy. Or maybe the fiber is felted. So maybe brush it out or throw it away and make it into mulch. If it won't slide and pull, it won't turn into yarn. But now, if it's short and poofy and there's not twist holding it small and tight into a string. Let me do this one more time, even more twist with just my fingers and no stick. Okay, that has some structural integrity, but it's gonna start to pull apart over time. So really short fibers are going to need a lot of twist. So if you're taking the cotton out of pill bottles or just you bought cotton balls and you unrolled them and started to twist them. Look at how long the little hairs are from the cotton plant. They are shorter. They'll need a lot more twist. Well, what kind of a machine to stick invention can I get that's going to help me out here? All right, let me do it up here. Twist, 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 twist. I sometimes cheat and make enough of a string to tie knots. That's not done in a lot of parts of the world, but it is one of my favorite cheats, is to be able to tie a knot. So if I get a string-like substance, if I really, really want to, I could tie a knot to my stick. The only wrong way to spin is to quit. So it's not cheating. There weren't rules in a contest. There we go. Now, all right, let's do it down here. Here we go. I'm adding twist and I'm letting it fall off the end of my stick. And my twist is getting added to my fiber, or fiber overlap. Now, when I slide back and I let more threads more cut woolen threads get twist. Did that not over the cereal bowl? The twist continues to go out. And I can still add more twist by twirling the stick. And now when I wrap it up on my spindle shaft here, Haha, -ha, there we go. Now I can put it in the bowl and go twirl, 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 twirl. And draft. And more thread is being made. So this is a supported method. Putting a spin. You need to move a little to your left. You're almost out of frame. Aha. Thank you. So I'm spinning off the end. There's no hook, there's no latch, there's no nothing. My fiber is getting more twist. And as I draw it out, my yarn is getting longer. So having a weight is going to help me with making centrifugal force help me add more twist. 
So one easy way to do this is to take a 36 inch long dowel and cut it into three parts and then get out a pencil sharpener and add nice little tips because those little tips will provide less friction if you're spinning on a surface. It's harder to see. Let me find one that's easier to see. Here we go. If I want to spin in a, um, a supportive fashion, putting it, putting a little tip on the end makes it easy to have small contact, less friction, more twisty twisties. And let's see if I can do it in frame in this direction. Here we go. I could get fancy bowls. Although I like this one a lot, the whole Tibetan bell getting rung every time I accidentally bump it bothers me every now and then. Oh. So, <laughs> so I can get out a coffee cup instead. The other nice thing about using a coffee cup if I want to spin supported is that I can just leave it in the coffee cup and it doesn't fall over. So that's super helpful. The other reason is the half hitch. So now I'm going to introduce another little thing about string and playing with sticks and managing all of this at the same time. And I'm going to take, yeah, let's do this guy. So my chopstick was helpful, but actually I'm going to use my chopstick. What if I wanted to push all the thread I made down to one end and use it suspended? There's a weight on the bottom. It's a fictional weight right now. <laughs> but I don't want the string to just unwind if I hang it near. Then I need something called a half hitch. Now, there are a couple different ways you can make a half hitch. The real trick is for you to find the one that works for you. For 22 years, what I used to do was hold my spindle on my spindle side, my fiber on my fiber side, and I would flip a loop around a finger. So one way to do that is to fold it over a finger. You do there. And twist it once. And then drop that loop over the top of the stick. And again, pull back with tension. You can do it with your fiber hand, twirling a loop so that there is a trap space. So I don't want to just do it, fold it over the finger and once through because that's just a loop. What I want is a loop that has a twist in it, then it will stay. That makes sense? There's a twist with a loop in it. Now, if I do it with my spindle hand and my thumb, I get up close and I've twirled my thumb trapped the yarn against the stick and then flipped the loop off my thumb onto my stick. And I'm going to do both of those again. If I'm on my fiber side, I can grab a loop and twist it, drop it over the spindle. If I'm doing it with my thumb over here, I can trap the yarn against the stick and flip that loop on my th thumb over the top of the spindle and then tighten it. Either one works. But now if I do that with a spindle that has a weight already on it, and in this case, polymer clay baked directly onto an oak towel. Get this up here, it is super easy to flip that half hitch off when I need to. That's why I make sharper points. It's why I don't like hooks. However, many people love hooks. So to be equitable for those who like hooks, <laughs> something that you can do there. I've wound on the thread that's barely showing up on camera, yay. And then I can flip my little loop and then put that loop with the twist in it on my hook. 
you can arrange where that thread goes to the hook. You could have notches in the whorl. Then when I'm hanging it, oh, wow, that's hard to do in frame. When I'm hanging it with gravity, it will start to untwirl the direction I was not spinning. So that can help me remember what direction was I spinning. If you can't remember, was I spinning clockwise or counterclockwise, let it untwirl and go, oh, right, got it. Untwirling is counter. This time twirling is clockwise. And I can fluff my fiber out. Ooh, this one is slightly felted so that it will do slidey, slidey, slidey. Very technical jargon, you see. And then when I'm sliding my hands here, this is part of the drafting. And then if I want to, I can pinch it off. When I let go, the new twist, once it's under tension, goes leaping from the narrow parts up from the old yarn to the new yarn and I can keep working. And this is where I can take and tuck my, my uh, fiber up into a bracelet. And in this case, I can even just twirl it on an angle because I'm sitting at a desk and I have lots of extra energy because it wants to coil up against itself. If I have tension on it, it looks like string. If I don't have tension on it, it looks like curly cues and pigtails. But if I tension it by setting it away from me, maybe trapping it with a, you know, some scissors and coffee cup. I could, this is one method, pinch with my spindle hand, pull with my fiber hand, pinch with my fiber hand, let go with the spindle pinch. This is called a pinch and pull or an inchworm technique. And it's totally okay if that's the way you want to work or if that's the way the fiber behaves. Sometimes the method you have to use for spinning is dictated by how the fiber was combed or carded or messed with or washed or barely washed, rinsed and put away wet. <laughs> well, then when I want to wind it back on again, I need to take it off the hook. So I've taken it off the hook and then my spindle hand is smart enough to wind thread on by twirling the stick and letting the new yarn go onto here which with Velcro techniques, I could just sit down and walk away from and then come and pick it back up again. If you are frustrated with trying to make yarn and you need to set it down, it is okay to put your half hitch on here. Oops. Really, really, you're gonna do that to me? Ha <laughs> ha, I don't use hooks very often. There we go. Add lots and lots of twist set it down, pinch, pull, pinch, like up. But if you have a fiber that's behaving and it doesn't need extra double-handed um, care and attention, let's say I've got some of this hand-blended pink and white, <laughs> and I wanna add it to this pink and white here, I'm gonna put my half hitch on my spindle and I can even put two hitches on right in a row. And now it's really gonna hold on. So now when I, I'm gonna take my fiber hand, I'm gonna put it above the camera. So my hand is going out of frame and I'm hanging it by the thread. There's the top of the spindle right at the camera. <laughs> but now when I add twist with my spindle hand, it's a little flick, 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 flick. And I'm adding my clockwise twist to the spindle, which you can see down at the bottom. You can see the rotation of the string going up and I have more and more twist in here. And now I can just start pulling back and letting the twist jump from old yarn to new yarn. Now let's put a bunch more twist in there. Twist, 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 twist. If I want to, I can even set it down for a moment. I've got some minor tension on it and I could look at this giant bump. 
giant, so huge. Yeah, so totally not giant. But if it's bothering me, there's rule number three. Do you like the yarn that you're making? Okay, well, if it's bothering me, how am I going to, just tugging is not enough. But what if both hands untwist on the two edges of the bump, slidey, 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 slidey. Now, when I put tension on it and all the twist goes, there's hardly a noticeable bump at all. So this is where I have a different rule of thumb when I am spinning. When you're brand, 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 brand new and you have a spindle, do not freak out about the little bumps until you have made three whole spindles worth of yarn because you need the repetition. With more repetition, you're going to have some more mechanics that you can tweak. But if you've never twirled a stick and held fiber and played with tension and thrown it down and picked it back up again, you have no idea how many variables you want to tweak. So this is maybe two thirds, three quarters, two thirds full. So I would still need to fill this up with even more yarn and then take that off and make more and take it off and make more before it's time to really stress out about thick and thin. Well, what do I do with it when it's done? Well, you could just wrap it into a ball, put it in a Ziploc bag and set it aside. You could take um, a cardboard tube from the center of some toilet paper and wrap all of your singles on a tube of cardboard, put it in a Ziploc bag and set, set it away. Um, if you don't like Ziploc bags because of the environment and plastic, feel free to make drawstring bags. Drawstring bags are awesome, but set it down and walk away from it. You also need your hands and muscles to recover. So it's totally okay to take breaks. Spinning should be one of those things that can happen in the um, spaces between other things because it's so portable with a spindle. Now I'll tell you though, if you decide that you're gonna make your spindles out of stainless steel barbecue skewers, that little pointy end, kind of stabby stabby. So find a safe way to not hurt yourself. I already ripped part of my skin open today, accidentally bumping into one of these, setting up my cameras today. So when you have sharp sticks, maybe beware that they are sharp. <laughs> it's the only good advice I have about sharp sticks on that. But a sharp stick, in a coffee cup is now a little bit safer, um, unless you have animals and small children and mischievous adults who are going to be stabby stabby with them. <laughs> um, but fill this up three times before you start to stress out about whether or not it's super thick or thin, and if that variable size is what you want or don't want. Uh, one more look back at my spindles here. See what else I wanted to do with that. I take this out of frame for a moment and twirl it hanging in front of me, which is my favorite gringo uh, US participant of spinning is to spin in front of me on a couch in front of the television. But now I've got enough twist that I've got pigtails when there's no tension. So that if I put tension on it, then when I pull away in the fiber, twist is trying to go into the new fiber. And when the twist no longer feels like it's trying to leap into the new fiber source, then it's time to add more twist again. So adding more twist, adding more twist, adding more twist. And that's the other reason I make a short little tail on some of these spindles is if I have to spin at a desk for Zoom, I have something on the far end that I can hold on to as opposed to holding it in my lap while I'm cold and I'm wrapped up in blankets and I have a water heater at my, a water bottle at my feet trying to keep my toes warm. I have this little guy here that I can twirl in hand and make twists go into my yarn and pull back on the fiber so that new fiber, and I'm gonna do a thick spot on purpose. The twist will go in, but when it's not going in anymore, that's when you need to add more. So I can always grab the fiber in a different place. And here's where, ah. Controlling the tension 
can also be done not just by pulling your hands further apart, but also by doing kind of an itsy bitsy spider uh, figure eight in my fingers. So if I pull back on my spindle so that everything has no pigtails, I can walk my fingers up to make figure eights so that hand, my hands are now close together. And that way I can use both hands to make things happen, like grabbing my half hitches here and untwirling the spiral going up the stick so that my half hitches will fall off the end. And now I can grab the stick and wind on. Now there's a couple different postures I could use to wind on. I could put the whirl at the bottom and twirl the yarn around the bobbin. Or I could flip it upside down so that the whirl is at the top and I can treat it like it's cotton candy. And I'm winding cotton candy onto my stick at the top until I'm ready to roll it up the stick if I'm going to spin in a bottom whirl fashion. If I'm gonna spin in a top whirl fashion, I'm gonna to wanna to put my half hitch on that little guy. And I can do that here twice as well. So now I've had two half hitches at the top which will secure it so that I can add twist to my stick. I have to do this out of camera, sorry. Adding twist, adding twist, adding twist, adding twist. I'm doing it slowly grasped. And you can see the barber pole happening. Oh, maybe not. I can slidey, slidey, slidey on the fibers. Let the twist go up. Slidey, slidey, slidey. I need more twist, add more twist, add more twist, add more twist. Keep going until the fiber no longer is moving twist up, then I have to add twist. If I wanna fix something large, maybe I've already made four spindles worth of yarn, so I have permission. <laughs> because you know, there's clearly a bunch of spindle police here, right? Yeah, there's no spindle police. Um, Untwisting the two ends will help me get that twist under tension to even out over my fiber source. Then I can do my itsy bitsy spider figure eights up my fingers to get my hands close so that both hands can work together, like sliding my half hitch off the end of my spindle and putting my new yarn on the spindle and saying, you know what, and that's totally enough for today. Velcro is good. I can set my spindle down. I can relax. Now that I have talked massive spindle basics, I'm going to unspotlight me, go to the gallery view for myself so I can see everybody, and I can see if there are any questions, things you want to see, things you want repeated. Solutions for your own stuff. Do you prefer to draft from the fold or draft from the length of the, the fiber? Ah, that is an excellent question. I didn't talk about what you can do with fiber other than I demonstrated only one direction. Ah, fiber could go many directions. So if I struggled and took the time to make all my little hairs parallel. If I then spin them into, oh, wait, here, let me spotlight again. Here I am like demoing and you can't see me. Add spotlight, oh, oh. I've taken the time to make it beautiful and parallel and I've taken stabby stabby Viking combs and I've forced them into a gorgeous parallel preparation. And then I went only this direction to make thread. This is worsted, W-O-R-S-T-E-D, worsted. But what if I had like just flat pet paddles of combs, um, combs, cards, 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 <sighs> words in English, oh dear. And I've brushed them all out and they've started to get more jumbled. I'm not gonna be able to make a very good one here. And then some of them have started to be other directions. I know this looks like crazy. 
if my threads are all higgledy piggledy and they've been done on pet combs, carding combs help. Flat ones are cards. Cards. I have brushed them on cards. <laughs> I've carded my wool. Higgledy piggledy. When I spin this, I'm going to get little folds and bubbles at that microscopic level of the structure of my yarn, which is going to be woolen. And so I like to think of the woolen yarns to remember which one they are. They are the uh, bubble wrap of yarn. The inside of the yarn has folded bubbly bits and that will trap the air. So woolen yarns are the fuzzy, warm, keep you warm, woolen blanket, wool, woolen structure. Well, what if I don't want to go higgledy piggledy or I don't have um, cards? <laughs> Look at the thing. What's the flat one called? Cards. Um, and I want an effect that has folded bubbly bits. Then, like Tanya was suggesting, so I have the option to take this. Oh, it was already prepared, and I could fold it. And if I pull off the fold, I know I have folded bits. So it ends up being semi woolen ish, depending on how crazy you want to get with jargon. So if I want to put air into my yarn and I want a fluffier yarn and I want a really bouncy, floofy yarn, going from the fold is great. Going from cards is great. Um, and basically, it's the yarn that's being made from the 90 degree angle of the prep. So you can see that as it gets folded, there's poofy foldy bits. Okay, and that's just looking <laughs> like other shapes. Uh, so I don't spin from the fold very often, but I'm usually not spinning a yarn that needs to be fluffy and poofy. But if I needed to spin a fluffy, poofy yarn, I would card it with flat cards, or I would spin from the fold. Does that help? It does help. <laughs> so that's another place where the rabbit holes start to happen. Um, and, and Maggie brings up a good point. Spinning from the fold works really great if you have really, really long fibers and you're having a hard time controlling them all, folding them over a finger and spinning off of that is going to be an excellent way to manage things that are just so long they're driving you bonkers. Very, very technical term driving you bonkers. Um, a couple of the places where the rabbit hole can happen is how much twist did you put in your singles? And then the next rabbit hole that we haven't talked about, what is a ply? Anyone want to describe what a ply is? Jargony jargon. Two sets of strings against tension with one another. Let's call this one string. This is singles. Doing a giant, giant, crazy bulk, bulky, bulky, bulky yarn. And what happens if I fold it in half and I put two of them next to each other? They want to untwist and they want to untwist around their partner. So technically, this is an extraordinarily bulky two ply yarn. <laughs> um, maybe it's not technically yarn at all because it's going to still pull apart if I put tension and, and power on it here. But the ply is when one or more strings, like um, Agnes points out, one or more strings that have been already twisted and then they wrap around each other to make a new structure. Most of the time, 95% of the time or more, they're going to be the opposite direction that they were made originally, with some exceptions, and that's just when you want to do it differently. So if both of these are singles, if they are both turned the same way when they are made into yarn yarn, I make two of them and hold one of them in my chin. <laughs> they're both gonna want to untwist the same direction. And if they give, if you give two strings a buddy and they both wanna untwist the same direction, 
that means they're going to be super stable when they get wrapped around each other. So let's see if this will actually do it. Yeah, it's already starting to like want to go around each other. So I'm going to put them around each other on purpose. There's a two-ply yarn. The most bulky two-ply yarn that's only 14 or 16 inches long. <laughs> wow, what a great piece. You know, maybe I'll use that in some art weaving. But <laughs> the point of that is that it becomes stable. Now, seeing that on a regular scale, let me get one of the things I've spun earlier. All of this has been spun the same direction. It's all one yarn on my spindle. And then we can do what we call a plyback. Take two parts by folding it over and let go and see it ply back on itself. Now, here's where some misbusting happens. Sure, that plied back on itself. But what does it tell me? It just tells me what a plyback looks like. It doesn't tell me what a two ply yarn looks like because I didn't put twist in on purpose for the ply. To put twin to put twist in on purpose. Uh, hey, this is a great one to sacrifice. All right, cool. I'm going to take my normal bracelet off, my normal spinning bracelet off, and I'm going to make a giant bracelet for plying. Oh, you're getting bonus content. I wasn't going to show plying, but I'm going to do it quickly. So <laughs> I'm making a claw hand that can hold a grapefruit. Very technical. I don't like grapefruit, so I'm kind of holding it reluctantly. And uh, Or I'm holding it for you. If you like grapefruit, I'm going to carry it over to you and let you take it off my hands because I didn't want it. Maybe it's a mango, maybe it's an avocado, because I don't like any of those either. So if you like avocado and you're around me and I have an avocado, it's yours. There we go. So now I've got the original first part of my spinning on the stick. And I have my last part tied around my finger loosely. And I have a bracelet now sliding onto my hand. This is a gigantic center pool ball without being a ball, and it won't collapse because my hand is in the middle. So this is tacked plying bracelet technique, and I've been plying from the two ends of my singles for probably 18 years or so, and there are other plying bracelets in the world. Um, they're not what you think they're called. If you hear of something called an Andean plying bracelet, it's not really what you think it is, but that's a longer, much bigger internet slap fight. And it's not really my bailiwick, but I'm gonna just tell you it's a Mythbuster. Here's two threads, two ends. And if I pinch here and I let go here, it's gonna remind me which way is the untwisting. Is it wrapped around its buddy? Aha, that's the right direction for plying. So here's where I'm not cheating, but I'm enjoying the technology of tying knots. I'm gonna tie a little knot on my stick. You don't have to, I like to. Now it wants to be twisted that way to wrap a buddy around itself. Okay, so that's my ply direction for my stick. Now, all I have to do is put my half hitch on, maybe put a second half hitch on. Oops, there was no fold in that. There we go. And now I can twirl, 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 twirl off camera because it's really super lightweight. This is the one that's only like, I think 17 grams total, 15 grams total. It's a really, really lightweight spindle right now. I have lots and lots of extra twists that I put in on purpose, the opposite of the direction of my regional spinning. Now I'm just going to unwind off my wrist and then apply tension. I want all of the threads to be under the same tension so that the twist will go up and make my yarn. So I now have two places that fork in the road. How much twist did I put into my single? and how much twist did I put into my ply? So you're gonna find out that that's subjective to your own spinning. 
You might um, spin something and call that low twist, medium twist, high twist. You might ply something and call it low twist ply, medium twist ply, high twist ply. Well, now we have a grid of nine samples to make to see what you like. If you put in so much twist that it always um, pigtails, that's probably a high twist. Too much twist is when it actually breaks. When you've stressed out the fibers so much that they no longer have structural integrity and they break under the strain, that's too much twist. But so much twist that it also still pigtails, that could be intentional. There are uses for yarn that has more twist than what I've heard Abby Frank call twist stasis. So you'll see people try to claim that the way to make yarn is to make a quote unquote balanced yarn so that once it's plied, it'll hang in a beautiful, beautiful U shape and it won't twist back on itself and it won't look under twisted whatever subjective phrase that is, um, you don't have to. There are many reasons why you might want a low twist single and a high twist ply. You might want medium and medium. You might want low and low. It depends on what you want the yarn to look like and how you want the yarn to behave. So don't let anyone tell you you're doing it wrong. The only wrong way to spin is to quit. You don't have to spin to be my friend. But if you want to spin, spin. <laughs> um, so here's, here is twist stasis. I have almost no tension on it and it's just hanging there. But although many people in English speaking spaces call that a balanced yarn, it's probably better to say it's in twist stasis and you might want that or you might want something different and that's okay. Either one, um, more twist, less twist, you just have rabbit holes that you can go down and do other things with the twist. Now we have ply. The moment we have two or more individual threads that were made with twist that are now wrapped around each other in the opposite direction, you have applied yarn where it was spun, let's call it clockwise, and plied counterclockwise. There's other ways to describe that too. Or maybe you make something really unique where two of them were spun clockwise and one of them was spun counterclockwise and now you plied them in a specific direction. Maybe you take a couple of those and ply them around each other and make a couple more and ply them around each other. You start getting into more rabbit holes, places you can fork in the road and go do other things. But Instead of Velcro on this one, if you're wondering about the yarn management of what do I do if I've got this ton of yarn on my um, wrist, but I need to go do something else, I can just put the spindle down the middle and let go, and then come back to it later by digging out the big center and putting my hand there. Bonus content. <laughs> Other questions? Can I see some photos? I've prepped some photos to share. Yeses, nos, maybes. I, I do have a question and I want to see photos. Excellent, excellent. Okay, okay. I have raw fiber, alhaca fiber, that has some bits and they some, like, some dirty bits in it. And it's not carded, it's not straight, it's not anything. Can I spin from that? You have fiber that is not carded. Can you spin directly from it? Absolutely. Okay. Okay, I can pull it out and I can kind of lay it straight. Is that what I want to do? Or I just want to spin from wads of it? Or is that if I want it woolen or worsted? Is it my choice? It is your choice. There are no spinning police. What you probably want to do is make experimental sample bits. So try spinning it as is. Try brushing it a little bit with brushes. Try combing it out with really long stabby combs. Try spinning it up from a fold. Try spinning it just from 
stuff you pulled from a Ziploc bag. And as you work with it, does the fiber slide easily? Are you able to draft it apart and make good overlaps? Did the twist go in neatly? Or did you hate the entire experience of gobbledygook from a bag and you loved it when it was carted out with a bunch of pet combs? Now you know what you're going to do. You're going to be carting it out mm -hmm. until it's manageable. Um, also, you're going to want to look into um, various fiber preparation methods and try to experiment with them. Spinning from the fold, spinning from something that's parallel, spinning from something that's been carded, uh, how tightly wrapped that tube of fiber source is. And as you find the ones you like, are they making the yarns that you like? So <laughs> you have a thousand forks in the road and you're the only one that gets to decide what part you like and what process you enjoyed. If any of those processes hurt you, let's not hurt yourself. <laughs> And then you can find, okay, this fiber doesn't like this preparation, or I didn't like my result when I used that preparation. That's really what that's going to be like. Does that help? Uh, yeah, yeah, that does, <laughs> that does help. That's lots of answers. <laughs> it is lots of answers. Um, probably the one number one rule that Abby has ever said, and I like to repeat, it depends, um, which is not a hard and fast rule for people that want the answer handed to them. But spinning is your experience and what you do with your hands, what you do with your tools, what you do with your fiber management, what you do with your fiber processing. Beyond that, it's up to you what you decide you want to do. Maybe you want to trade that fiber to somebody else. Maybe that's your conclusion and that's okay too. Or maybe you find out that unprocessed alpaca makes a cloud of dust and you can't breathe. Okay, let's process the fiber so that you can spin and you're not dying from the dust that's kicked up. But maybe you only spin outdoors in the Andes in the mountains and the air is clear and the dust never gets to your nose. Okay, cool. <laughs> or maybe your body is allergic to alpaca. Now it's time to trade for a fiber that doesn't irritate your body. Okay, I'm gonna show you some pictures. Do, 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 do. Share my screen, I think. Share my screen. Share, there we go. Uh, so when I have made polymer clay spindles, um, I have typically taken full size 36 inch dowel rods, cut them in thirds. And in this case, you can see that I've barely cut through them and then snapped the um let me move this out of the way and do this and then do zoom in i've snapped the dowel rods so they are rough and crazy right there um and to make them not rough and crazy i didn't even have pencil sharpeners at that time i went out to a sidewalk and i scraped the dowel rods on the sidewalk as sandpaper until i was sufficiently happy with the result <coughs> So um, yeah, this can be super done on the cheap. Uh, but then again, I also found some sandpaper that was just in my stuff. And I was like, well, maybe I should use sandpaper. Um, so cut them apart. This is typical cheap polymer clay that was in samples. And I bought, what is that? 12 colors for $10. And I made, I think 15 spindles total. So. Each individual spindle was less than a dollar, which was a great way to give away spindles to students without breaking my bank. Um, they baked directly on the dowel rods. And this is before I even um, sharpened them down more than just non-stabby stabby. So you don't have to put hooks or notches on your spindles. They can literally be a weight on a stick, but it's also your experience for what you like and what will twirl. Um, I made them all round this last time, and these skewers, I was given a tip on where to buy on Amazon, and I'll share the links later, a um, hundred stainless steel skewers that are about 13 and a half inches long, and one end is pointy for $15, so what is that, 15 cents per, um, 
per uh, stabby stabby stick. <laughs> and I just propped them up on tin foil to bake them. And then when I made more, I did half of them. I did a whole bunch more on bell rods. And so now what I have are these spindles here, which then I made certain I could test. Could I spin thread on these spindles? And the answer is yes. You can use these to make thread for less than a dollar a stick with a weight on it that I baked in the oven. But if you have breathing problems with polymer clay, there is some off-gassing and you might not want to use polymer clay in your oven. Have your friends do it for you and then have them deliver them to your house in a safe and socially distant COVID safe manner. And now you have spindles that you didn't have to bake. <laughs> yes, I will definitely share the Amazon links to where I got the 100 skewers for $15 um, and they were Amazon. So if you have an issue or as Maggie suggests, yeah, you don't have to bake um, polymer clay. You could get air dry clay as well. Um, but the um, if, you, if you have a problem with Amazon, I don't know another source, but at least you'll have some information to be able to hunt on the internet for sources that are non-Amazon based. Uh, do I have any success stories of spinning cat fur and would I need to add supplementary non-feline fiber? So I was given, um, oh, my precious kitten had died. Well, not kitten. I bet my cat had died and I saved the fur from the last time we went to the groomers. I'll ship it to you. Can you make yarn? And um, I have this mistake of taking on these uh, helpful things without actually having seen the fiber and received it and went, wow, this is so matted. Oh, dear. So the quality of the fur is what really matters, not which type of animal or plant it came from. This fur was matted. So I had to not only card and comb it out as best as I could, but it was really super short and I didn't really want to spin it with high twist to make just cat fur thread. So I had to card it anyways. I carded it with wool and spun it on a wheel because by then I'd put so much effort in for almost no monies. I was like, I'm not spinning this on spindles anymore. I was covered in so much cat fur. So if you want to spin your cat fur, you can. Uh, be aware of the flyaway nature of short fibers, especially short fibers blended with other fibers that were hand blended by you. Absolutely you can, just like you can spin Angora bunny. But Angora bunny furs will likely float in the air and go up your nose the way perhaps uh, recently cut fake fur might fly around the room and go up your nose. So if you are in a nice high humidity space with excellent ventilation and you occasionally mist yourself down with a spray bottle, you can perhaps manage some of your flyaways and not have them go entirely all up your nose. But that would be my recommendation. Yes, you can. It could be interesting. I'd love to see your samples. <laughs> Other questions people might have. Techniques you struggle with, techniques you'd like to learn, things I probably forgot to mention. Of course, you may absolutely unmute yourself and ask questions. Okay, um, I think we, we might have missed my, my question earlier. I have some alpaca wool that I got from a neighbor and she's really excited to see what I do with it. And I've tried sitting down at my spinning wheel several, several times and I can't spin with it because it just falls apart on me. Okay, so here is an excellent example of when you combine your tool and your technique with your fiber, that you have a number of places you might have your variable that you might need to tweak to get a better result. If working at your wheel is not helpful at first with a fiber, maybe stop and go on a spindle because you can go a little bit slower to do some of the analysis. If the fiber is super slick and fly away, then you might need to change how you're drafting, like how much fiber you're holding at a time, how much fiber you're letting go into the twist so that you can start to find a yarn that's becoming more stable 
like it has enough hairs and enough twists that it's becoming a useful product as opposed to not enough hairs so thin it falls apart not enough twist so thin it falls apart or if it is so slick that managing both the twist and the drafting is a problem it might be something worth blending with a second fiber so that the textures start to behave together in a fashion that you like. Okay. Everything will go back to that famous rule, it depends. Uh, yep, yep, yep. Well, <laughs> you're right. But I have to figure out how to get the depends on the right side of the equation. Yes. So that's when going slower um, might be easier for the analysis because it might be that the drafting method that you're using needs to be slightly tweaked. Maybe you need to be having it, um, having combed it out or carded it out so that it, it feels parallel again, or it's rolled up into a nice, here's a piece of jargon, roll ag, um, a typical description of what you get when you roll off of a card. So if you had a big, large pet brush and then you rolled all the hair off the end, you could have a little tornado of fiber in a little tube. And that tube you could roll between your hands and make slightly tighter, which is almost felted-ish. Or maybe in your fiber preparation, you can spin it off the fold and maybe it'll behave. Or maybe it is so short that spinning off the fold doesn't work well with your hands. So then you might need to look at either um, combing, carding it out or um, combining it with another fiber. It's pretty long fiber. It's just incredibly slick. And when I try to work with it, it just comes apart on me. I think you've probably worked with that kind of alpaca before. Yeah. And if it's really long and slick mm -hmm. and it's falling apart on you, it's probably time to look at adding more twist okay. before you draft more fibers into it to see if that okay. gives it structure. Well, I'll give that a try. Um, one other question in terms of um if i'm if i'm using clay and making my own um hmm, uh, yeah making my own spindles now what i would be doing is regular potter's clay with this is there any particular shape or weight that you recommend this is where your own preferences really matter so i took the time to make four completely different spindles uh, a few months ago, let's see if I can find the other one. Uh, one, two, three, four. And I weighed them out on a kitchen scale in grams. Mm -hmm. And then I even wrote it down, I think, on each of the spindles, although it might be under. Uh, so here we go. This one is 21 grams. This one is 17 grams. This one is 23. And this one is 25. And then I experimented with making yarn on each one to see what really mattered to me. And 17 and 21 were a little bit harder to get started. They felt a little light to me. By 23, it felt perfect from minute one. And 25 is going to be excellent. But that was for this size yarn with this fiber. I enjoyed it. These other ones that I've recently made are almost all 15 grams, maybe 16 on a couple of them. And I just love the feel of them. But a lot of these ones, I was spinning in a supported fashion in a bowl. And 15 grams was enough to get that centrifugal force on that tiny skewer immediately. But on the wooden dowels in a suspended fashion, I liked mm -hmm. it to be about 25 grams instead of 15. So it's a personal preference and an experimental stage. And uh, what do you have a specific uh, recommendation in terms of what material to use for a spindle? Um, I mean, is pine or hardwood preferable? Or I love the feel of these oak dowel rods, but I only like the ones that are a quarter inch. The three eighths inch feel a little big on my hands. Okay. But my favorite spindles in the universe are the ones that I have from Peru, and these shafts are whittled. In fact, I have to show you these. Let's go to this guy. Spotlight for everyone. These shafts are whittled um, fairly roughly out of eucalyptus, and you can actually see that there are flat planes, and they are not perfectly round. 
I love the grip on these. They feel very much like bamboo. The eucalyptus has an excellent texture. It's super easy for me to grab the stick and add twist. So these are now my super, super favorite. Um, I love all of my Indian ones. They are eucalyptus shafts and they are balsa wood whirls because that's what they're using there. But like Maggie suggests that she's got many of her trade beads on bamboo skewers or chopsticks, whatever fits the bead. Uh, this one that I showed you earlier with the hook on it, this is a commercial chopstick. You can even see the little um, banding and decorative chopstick nature and um, poured resin. Uh, and so there's like a little rubber stopper in the center and um, there was somebody on the internet whose sister was making these and her sister happens to be developmentally challenged, but she's now making poured resin and um, there's sparkly bits and beads in there on chopsticks and selling them. And I was like, sure, I'll, I'll support your sister. It's probably about two inches wide in circumference and about a quarter inch thick. Um, which is a real comfortable size for my hands, but I have spindles that are much larger. This one being balsa doesn't add a lot of weight to be larger. Um, also, there are, of course, spindles that you can purchase that are cross arm spindles. You might hear them call, called Turkish spindles, but they're not the only spindle used in Turkey. And Turkey is not the only place where they're used. So it's more accurate to call them a cross arm spindle. And these are really cool because many of them are designed to come apart and pack flat or mm. very nearly flat, which is super nice. So um, but if you are casting in pewter or lead or um, creating out of clay and pottery or ceramics, a whirl. One of the nice things about this ambient design is that if you use a whittled, ooh, that's not gonna, let me find an empty one. Maybe not. Um, yeah, sure, I'll just do this one. Is that this slides and the whittled stick is slightly mm. wider at one point so that mm -hmm. when I slide the world down the shaft it'll stop on the slightly wider carved spindle shaft and that's super helpful um, there are a number of recreationist artists that will make worlds on spindle shafts and the spindle shafts are a little bit more um, the bulbous section is up a little and they, they intend the world to come up from the bottom. I uh, don't have a good example around here. So imagine that this was the bottom of the, of the spindle and it came up to and nestled really snug against the wood. But I have found that I'm less comfortable with um, the shaft being skinnier on the bottom and then being slightly wider on the bottom to hold the whirl because I prefer to spin with my whirl on the bottom. Okay. That's actually an interesting thing for me to also show. Does that answer part of your question, Agnes? Uh, it gives me some things to think about and you know probably play around with. So what is the difference between spinning with a bottom whirl or a top whirl? Actually, let me get this guy back. Get that out of camera view. Here we go. I think that the difference really has more to do with the comfortable ergonomics of your wrist when you flick the twirl into the spindle shaft. If I like to reach up and do the flick, like I'm turning a light bulb in a ceiling, if that's the most comfortable ergonomics, reaching up to the stick with the whirl above me is what I am comfortable doing when I use a top whirl orientation for spinning. But if I prefer to reach down and turn a faucet on the floor, so my wrist is reaching down towards the floor to do the flick, then I like to put the whirl at the bottom and reach for the shaft and spin the shaft with my wrist of my spindle hand reaching down towards the floor to do the twist. I showed that to one student and 
she tried both right hand and left hand and she tried reaching up and she tried reaching down until she said, oh, you know what? I am so much more comfortable if I reach up to flick. And so she began spinning entirely top whirl because she would reach under and reach up on the shaft and that was more comfortable for her. But I like the posture of my wrist reaching down so I put the whirl at the bottom and I reach down to the stick and add the twist. That's something for you to experiment with. Is it the left hand that you like to use to twirl a stick? Is it the right hand that you like to twirl a stick? Do you prefer to reach down towards the stick and twirl? So maybe the stick should be at the top and the whirl should be at the bottom. Or do you like to reach up to twist the stick? Maybe the whirl should be right above your hand and you're working on the lower part of the shaft with the whirl at the top. Ah, and one more trick with half hitches. For years, what I would do is I would twirl around the bottom a little bit, then come up and put my half hitch on the stick. And I had this big diagonal string hanging here and I could easily put my thumb underneath the string and flick the half hitch off, untwirl the anchor from the bottom, and then put my new yarn on. And then I would return to an anchor on the bottom plus a half hitch on the top. And some loving friends said, oh, you spin with flying buttresses. I did. I did for more than 20 years spin with a flying buttress right there. And it was the most stable anchor for me at that time. Then I decided a few months ago to see if I could learn another technique because I'd already been spinning for 22 years with only this one. And I decided to get rid of the anchor on the bottom and try just rolling up the spindle of yarn that was made using my spindle hand to put the half hitch on. Ooh, I almost did that in frame. Excellent. There we go. Two half hitches and then keep spinning. Oops, I got to do this one in this direction. And now, instead of flicking my thumb underneath the flying buttress in order to pull the half hitch off, now I grab my spindle with both hands and my fiber hand holds on to the half hitches, grabs the half hitches, and I twirl my spindle to pull the half hitch off the end in an unwinding fashion. So it winds up the shaft, twirly, 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 half hitch, half hitch. And then when I want to take it off, I untwirly and I pull. And that's how I get my half hitch off. Now, you might find another technique for your half hitch that works. The trick is to be able to put the half hitch on and take the half hitch off thousands and thousands of times. So if it causes you pain, change it. <laughs> and if you're curious about trying something new, change it. Maggie is holding up a number of spindles in frame and I'm wondering if that's because you wanted to show us something. If you wanna unmute Maggie, do you mind if I, I stop you? Time. I just figured I would sit there and hold them in frame until you notice. <laughs> okay, so. And this is in relation to the question about making your own spindles. Each one of these I made. And so this one is just an unadulterated bamboo skewer with a bead jammed onto it. There's the paint on this, the skewer, the original shiny green paint. <laughs> this one is one of my favorite production spindles. And it's just a bamboo skewer and a carved bone bead I found for 50 cents at a street market. <laughs> but it spins a little wonkily supported, but once it's suspended, it really doesn't matter. Mm, so and that way you use suspended. That's so why I use suspended. And you'll notice there's a bend in the skewer. I suspend it and make sure that the hitch is coming off of this face. Mm. Sometimes I will still buttress this one to remind me where I want the yarn to run because then it hangs more evenly. Got it. The skewer warped over the years and it just works. <laughs> And I, I couldn't leave the spider bead in the shop. Oh, no, that's an excellent example. 
Now, for people that want to try a top whorl, this one, the bead fit on one end of the skewer, and then after it was in place, I threaded the hook on, so even if it split, it wouldn't matter. Nice. This is just a, this is just a chopstick, and the bead happened to pressure fit really well onto it. This is another of my production spindles. It's just a chunk of bamboo skewer and an acrylic or a resin bead that I found somewhere that everyone thinks is amber, so I bring it all over the place with me. <laughs> this one is a glass disc. Again, on the same, there's the square end of the unadulterated chopstick to prove to people that equipment doesn't have to be expensive. I think right. this one was 50 cents or a dollar for this, the, the uh, glass bead as well. Nice. But yeah, these ones and the spider are my three favorite of my handmade spindles. And then I've got a toy wheel on a dowel that happened to pressure fit really well. Huh? It's a pencil sharpener to both ends. Wooden toy wheels are a very common, fast way to make a spindle. This one is a ball finial for like a drawer pull or something. Again, on a chopstick. Nice. And I just put a cup hook into the top and then I pulled it open. It, nice. it was actually an eye, it was an eye, and I just pulled it open with pliers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because it had a square profile, it tends to hang from the point. Nice. And then this one's a just flattened glass bead on another chopstick. And it, again, doesn't care if it's not straight, it spins just fine. <laughs> Excellent. How, how straight this one is. I'm going to take the spotlight back off and go back to uh, looking at everybody to see if I can catch anyone else's eye who wants to show anything off. Alex, you've been spinning a good majority of the time I've ever caught a glimpse of you. Do you want to show us what you're using as your tool? I ordered last night with 30 minutes to spare the Amazon spindle <laughs> that I thought was weird because it has the hook on the far end away from the weight. Mm -hmm. and was trying to figure out how that works and I have the alpaca um wool that was sent to me by by Kungrid here and have found it to be very matted and I've been trying to tease it apart little by little to try to get some straight areas to it and I don't think I'm getting big bulges but I don't think I'm getting nice thin fibers either so I'm somewhere in between you have three whole spindles worth to spin before you get to start playing with that. One of the things you can do with your spindle, if you want to hold that back up again, is now that you've made some yarn, you'll be tying it close to the whirl and then either spiraling up and half hitching on the hook okay. or wrap an anchor at the bottom and then come up flying buffer style and do the half hitch at the end. And if you hate the hook, you can take the hook off and put the half hitch on the dowel yeah. either way. Or you might come up with another solution that I haven't even suggested yet. Yeah, I mean, I it, in it because it has like the groove and I wasn't sure how to use the groove on, on this, if that's a mess up or if that's supposed to be there. <laughs> it, it could be because of the flying buttresses style uh <laughs> but it also could just be because a woodworker made a thing because they heard that they should and then they did without yep. asking a spinner which is yeah. really common as well yeah i'm suspicious if i took this end off and put it on this end it would look like everybody else's <laughs> <laughs> and like many suggests you can also sand off any of the uh tapers or hooks or notches if you don't like them perfect all right, I'm removing that spotlight. I'm going back to looking at everybody. What are you spinning with today, Tanya? Oh, I was going to show Alex. My, my spindle that I bought, that's a commercial spindle. I got it at a uh, village spin and weave in Solvang back when it was still around. Um, but mine also has a notch there. And yep. I, yeah, I like to use it for when I'm doing bottom whirl style. It kind of locks my yarn in there nicely. Yep. Um, yeah, but I like you that sure your hook is on that end. And mine, you know, you're yeah, when you said bottom whirl, um, I think that the orientation you just started to show me was that the thread would go through the notch and head towards the hook. Yes. Which, if it was suspended, would be top whirl. Hmm. You yes. hung it from the hook, it would be top whirl in that okay. orientation. Yeah. Um, well, I, I, I hook it from the bottom like, um, nice. 
This is like older thread that uh, somebody got for me. Ah, oh, somebody. Hmm. Somebody. <laughs> hmm. um, but I'll do like a half hitch on the bottom here or do the, go through the hook and then I'll come back up through the top. Oh, flying buttress style. Yes, yes. <laughs> for, for the uh, other one. Excellent. Someone else started to unmute. I had uh, unmuted there. I uploaded a photo of what I'm doing most of my spinning on. I have three drop spindles. Unfortunately, when I moved up to Riverside County, um, uh, the one that was by far the best of them was the only thing that broke in the move. The shaft mm -hmm. broke and I haven't changed it, but pretty shortly after that, I got this Louette wheel that's about 40 years old and it is just a joy to own. Excellent. Yeah, we haven't even started to talk about what happens when your tools are more than just a stick and we start getting into different types of wheels and how those wheels behave in providing twist and if those wheels do take up automatically or if you have to wind on yourself, such as like a great wheel. Um, so a number of places that the path will branch there and definitely beyond the regular basics basics. Kungan, did you have uh, something you wanted to show us? If you want to unmute. Yeah, well, 10 years ago, I tried using a drop spindle and I, I gave it away and the fiber the same day that I tried because I was very frustrated. Uh, <laughs> but so um, Alex and I are using the same fiber and I'm, I think that I'm making this. You have yarn. I you have, have yarn. I have some yarn here. So question, if I release the tension, it turns into the pigtails. That's uh -huh. okay, right? Yes, okay, because okay. what it is showing is that there is additional twist right now, and the thread is not in a stasis balanced space, but it's a single, Ooh. and maybe you want that much twist for either applying that you might do later, or because you want a highly energized single. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. Right. Okay. <laughs> now you're so, making yarn. Right now okay, you so are now just gonna, making yarn. I'm going to walk this up my fingers right yeah. and i'm gonna take my hitch off yes okay and then and, and i and i missed the part the point of the hitch is because you have finished yarn beneath the hitch right especially if you're going to hang the spindle from the yarn and you don't want the yarn to fall off the stick the okay. half hitch holds the yarn and the stick together especially if you're going to hang it from the thread even if you are um, just going to hold it in hand or suspended, most of those do not use half hitches because you're already controlling both the stick and the fiber with your two hands. But if you hang the stick in the air and it does the centrifugal force spinny, 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 spinny in the air, the half hitch is what keeps the thread attached to the stick. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think I'm making string here. It's really you are. Okay. Well, okay. So then I'll need to know, uh, um, and maybe in the future I can reach out to you about washing this because this is um, not processed at all. Excellent. So if you, well, any yarn, any yarn that you make, when you are at the point where you're thinking, okay, I think I'm done with this. I've added my twist. I did whatever plying I wanted. I did whatever fancy whatevs that I did. Now I'm going to do something that's going to be a wet finishing step. And wet finishing your yarn is mostly get it into water, get it dry again. And that's it. Um, some yarns really like to be, um, let me put myself back in the spotlight so that I'm the one talking to everybody. Some, some yarns really just need some water and that's it. Other yarns might like to be in some warm or hot water and then dried. There are some things on the internet which will tell you that you have to stretch your yarns while drying them. Well, uh, think about what you know about how fiber and yarns and fabric does under tension. Is it going to stretch out? Is that your intention? Did you want it to be stretched out? 
you could hang something from your yarn. It will give you a dried result of yarn with tension. Or you could control the yarn in a large circle with stabilizing yarns to keep it from getting tangled and just hang it to dry over the edge of a fence post or a shower curtain or uh, just a, um, uh, a hanger off of a cupboard over a sink in the kitchen. There are so many ways in which you can keep the yarn from getting tangled and let it dry without necessarily putting large puddles in your house. Maybe it's drying outside, but maybe it's not drying where other animals can get it. So <laughs> whether your animals are indoors or outdoors, maybe your outdoors is cold. Maybe you don't want to freeze all of your yarn into icicles, or maybe your outdoors is windy and dusty and you don't want that to get into your yarn. If you have a yarn that needs to be quote unquote washed, uh, you probably want to be slightly gentle with it at first and wash it by hand. Maybe it needs more than one soak to get uh, dust and dirt out of it. There are a lot of places where fiber is processed minimally, spun, and then the yarn is washed because the yarn is stable and can handle some agitation or some soap or some hot water. Uh, but agitation plus soap plus hot water makes felt. Mm -hmm. So you wanna use them either only two of those three or in sparingly, um, sparing portions of agitation or soap or hot water. Because if you put all three of them together in large quantities, you will get felt or tangles. <laughs> and so if you went to the trouble of making yarn, maybe you don't want to make salt or maybe you do. So there's another place where you could be forking your textiles choices. I made this yarn and I want it to become felt. Excellent, good on you. But if you want to not make felt, then don't shock with lots of hot water agitation and soap all at the same time in large quantities. With the alpaca yarns that usually get made and then washed, it might take three or four rinses to get clear water coming out of the yarns. That could be very normal. Other questions? Uh, one more from me. When it comes to washing animal fibers, are we trying to remove all animal oils and get them like sterile and get them clean? Or are you just trying to- It depends. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> There are many uses of wool yarns that have the lanolin still in them in order to make something that has a waterproofing level to it. Now, I'm not saying that your sweaters filled with lanolin are waterproof, but maybe they are good proof against much water. Um, so it depends on what the nature of the fiber is that you were using and how you want the yarn to behave and what your finished object might need to behave like, whether that finished object is the yarn. Let me give you some permission, granting you permission right now. If what you want to make is just yarn and nothing else, go for it, you can do that. I have spent most of my 23 years making just yarn and not making something with it. I don't like to knit. I don't really like to crochet unless, you know, something, catches my fancy and it's the shiny for three months and then that's what I do for three months and then I'm done. But recently I finally liked a specific yarn creation for a specific woven product. And so this was made from yarn that me and my weaving best friend made and we shipped it across the world at each other and then we wove it. So I now like making woven cloth by hand, crazy, crazy, crazy by hand, uh, more than I like anything else. But I also have bags and bags and bags of yarn that I made for the purpose of making yarn because I enjoyed making it. So you absolutely have permission. If that's what you want to do, by all means, please do it. It might be that it becomes a great trade item with people who like to knit or who like to crochet or who like to weave large blankets for you. Excellent, now you have a trade good. Or maybe it's just what keeps you calm and keeps you from killing other people. 
Yay, you could spin and save lives. Please feel free to save your own life with the sanity that can be granted by spinning. If the spinning is making you angry, go ahead and step away from it. It's okay to step away from the things that are making you angry. And you might come back to it with a clear head and some uh, better caffeination or some better nutrition and you're ready to face it or you've locked the cats in the other room so you can finally face your spinning, whatever survival technique you have. But your three questions are, are you making yarn? Does it hurt? Do you like the yarn you made? And if we can get, yes, you're making yarn and no, it doesn't hurt. Everything else is part number three. Do you like the yarn you made? And if you don't, what can we change to make a different yarn? <laughs> Sleeping on new skills is extraordinarily important. Not only will you get the chance to maybe dream about solutions, haha, but also sleeping reinforces that your brain is going to make the paths of your new adventure so that you can then handle having acquired a new skill and make the next new change that you want to modify. That you definitely have to sleep on it. Um, so are you making yarn? Does it hurt? If you can get past to those, you're well on your way to now. Do you like the yarn you're making? If not, let's make some changes. Any other questions? Are people excited? I see a couple of nods, a couple of thumbs up. Woo, Krista's got See, something. we are excited. Krista's got something to show. I'm going to, I'm going to put you into the spotlight, Krista. Oh Lord. Okay. Um, so this is my Spanish peacock fiddle that I got from somebody like mm, almost eight years ago. And I'm finally actually making progress with it. So this is awesome. Thank you. Yay! Also, storage tip, one of those wine fingers works perfectly. Those are excellent also for storing. And things. has a lid. Nice. That's a tip from my bestie. Excellent. I'm going to take you Ooh. off the spotlight. Is there anyone Some else who has something you'd like to show or share or ask? Well, I have had an absolute blast with you guys tonight. I hope that this has given you some new things to try, some new perspectives, some ideas about where you want to take your fork in the road and play with it. Um, if you don't like the side of the road that you've chosen to go down, feel free to come back and pick a different path. I love to be available for spinning questions and spinning experiments. I also love to be available for one-on-one -on -one Zooms. If you just want some quiet time with Kat, with Ailey uh, for an hour or a half an hour, and you just want to like pick my brain and you want me to hand you resources to look up on the internet, you can now, you now know how to find me through Facebook. Um, I'll be certain to put a few links into the event as a follow-up and then possibly into just February in general. And of course, this recording will be available for anybody who wasn't able to be here tonight. But I want to give you all a round of applause and thank you for your great questions and your attention and your show and tells. And thank you for being here with me. Thank you so much, Kat. <laughs> thank you, Kat. Bye. Bye everyone. Take care.